joining us here in person and also uh, everybody who is uh, here online. So we have, uh, and, and I want to say uh, that this panel uh, uh, titled uh, The Court and the People was assembled and conceived really uh, by a Matrix postdoctoral scholar, Julia Sisex. I want to thank her. And uh, it's part of our Matrix On Point series, a series of events on pressing issues of the, of the moment. Um, and it is also co-sponsored by Berkeley uh, Law School. Uh, we have assembled a stellar group of Berkeley faculty to discuss the most recent round of Supreme Court decisions, which have often seemed out of sync uh, with the wishes of the American people. So as scholars, they can offer us uh, historical grounding and uh, insights that move us beyond the headlines, and we are really thrilled to have them here to, to discuss this enormously consequential ideological shift or series of ideological shifts. So before we get started, though, let me announce a few upcoming events. Uh, on November 9, we will be having a panel on Sandra Eder's new book, How the Clinic Made Gender, about the history of medicine and gender. On Friday, December 2nd, we will be having a Matrix on Point panel entitled Myth and Misinformation, uh, in which we ask scholars to show how myths circulate about marginalized groups historically and today. So now it is time for me to introduce our moderator. Ronit Stahl is an associate professor in the history department at UC Berkeley. She's a historian of modern America whose work focuses on the interaction of law, politics, and religion. Her first book, Enlisting Faith, How the Military Chaplaincy Shaped Religion and State in Modern America, traces the uneven processes through which the military struggled with, encouraged, and regulated religious pluralism over the 20th century. Her current research examines the rise of institutional and corporate rights of conscience in healthcare through a history of religious hospitals and government funding for them. So without further ado, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Ronit, and this is uh, for you. This is your talk. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you for everyone uh, for joining us today. It's been um, a really transformative several years at the Supreme Court with new justices um, and uh, quite a few decisions that have uh, shifted the landscape of um, American law um, in a range of domains. So I'm really excited to introduce our speakers today who will be addressing um, some of the ways we've seen uh, significant and transformative change over the past few years. Um, first, we'll have uh, Erwin Chemerinsky, who is the Dean of Berkeley Law. He is the author of 15 books, including leading case books and treatises about constitutional law, criminal procedure, and federal jurisdiction. His most recent books are Presumed Guilty, How the Supreme Court Empowered the Police and Subverted Civil Rights, and The Religion Clauses, The Case for Separating Church and State. He has written hundreds of law review articles and is a regular writer for numerous newspapers across the country. He frequently argues appellate cases, including in the US Supreme Court. In 2017, National Jurist Magazine again named him the most influential person in legal education in the United States. It's big. <laughs> um, <laughs> and in 2022, he is serving as the president of the Association of American Law Schools. Next, we'll have uh, Tom Biolzi, who is a professor in the Ethnic Studies Department and specializes in Native American studies. Most of his work focuses on the history of tribal government and tribal struggles over sovereignty in the realm of jurisdiction, which is to say the authority to make tribal law and to enforce it over all persons within tribal territory. His books include Organizing the Lakota, the Political Economy of the New Deal on Pine Ridge and Rosebud Reservations, Deadliest Enemies, Law and Race Relations on and Off the Rosebud Reservation, and Power and Progress on the Prairie, Governing People on Rosebud Reservation. And finally, we'll have Kiara Bridges, who's a professor of law at UC Berkeley Law School. She has written many articles con uh, concerning race, class, reproductive rights, and the intersection of the three. Her scholarship has appeared in 
many law reviews, including the Harvard Law Review, Stanford Law Review, Columbia Law Review, California Law Review, NYU Law Review, Virginia Law Review, and many others. She's also the author of three books, Reproducing Race, An Ethnography of Pregnancy as a Site of Racialization, The Poverty of Privacy Rights, and Critical Race Theory, a Primer. She is a co-editor of a reproductive justice book series that is published under the imprint of the University of California Press. I'm delighted to welcome all of our speakers here today who um, have a wealth and depth of knowledge about the law and the current court. And with that, I'll turn it over to Erwin Chemerinsky. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's an honor to be part of this panel. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that last year in the Supreme Court was the most dramatic term in my lifetime. You might have seen an article in the New York Times at the end of the term that said that by its analysis, it was the most conservative term of the Supreme Court since 1931. It was a year where the Supreme Court changed the law, not incrementally, but dramatically. It was a year where the Supreme Court dealt not with minor or technical issues, but enormously important questions that affect all of us, often in the most important, the most intimate aspects of our lives. I thought I would address several questions. How did we get here? What made last term so dramatic? What might we expect this term? And what should we look for in the long-term future of the Supreme Court? In terms of how we got here, we're a court with six conservative justices, all appointed by Republican presidents, and three liberal justices appointed by Democratic presidents. That is true last term, where the three liberals were Justices Breyer, Senator and Kagan. It's true this term, where the three liberals are Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson. This is unique in American history. Until relatively recently, we had liberal justices who were appointed by Republican presidents. Think of John Paul Stevens or David Souter. And we've had conservative justices appointed by Democratic presidents. Think of Byron White, or before that, Felix Frankfurter. Between 1960 and 2020, we had 32 years with a Republican president and 28 years with a Democratic president, almost exactly even. In fact, it will be even in 2024, 32 years with a Democrat and 32 years with a Republican. But between 1960 and 2020, Republican presidents picked 15 justices for the Supreme Court, while Democratic presidents picked only eight justices for the Supreme Court. That's an almost two to one difference. I can put it another way. President Donald Trump picked three justices in his four years in the White House. The prior three Democratic presidents, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, so to combine 20 years in the White House, and in those 20 years, they picked only four Supreme Court justices. Some of this is about the accident of history when vacancies occurred. Richard Nixon got to pick four justices in his first two years as president. Jimmy Carter got to pick no justices in his four years as president. But some of it is what I think is a result of court packing by the Republicans. The Republicans and on precedent move blocked the consideration of Chief Judge Merrick Garland the Supreme Court, and then in an act of stunning hypocrisy, rushed through Amy Coney Barrett right before the November 2020 election. So let me move and talk about last term of the court. Let me just identify a few areas that support the conclusion that it really was a momentous year by any and all measures. One, of course, is abortion. In Dobbs versus Jackson was held on Friday, June 24th, the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade. My colleague Chiara is gonna talk in detail about this case. In fact, one thing that wasn't mentioned in the introduction is that Chiara was asked to write the foreword to this year's Harvard Law Review. One professor in the country each year gets to do it. It's like being elected to the Hall of Fame as a law <laughs> professor. And Chiara got to do it this year and of all terms, got to write about Dobbs and the implications of that decision. And it's a brilliant article. <laughs> in 1973, in Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court held that women have the constitutional right to terminate pregnancies and to the point of viability. In Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, 
the Supreme Court reaffirmed that. What's often forgotten is that both Roe and Casey were bipartisan decisions. Roe was seven to two. The majority opinion was written by Justice Harry Blackman, who had been appointed by Republican President Richard Nixon. The majority included Chief Justice Warren Burger and Justice Lewis Powell, who had been appointed by Republicans. The two dissenters were Byron White, who had been appointed by President Kennedy, and William Rehnquist, who had been appointed by President Nixon. Even more dramatic, when the Supreme Court reaffirmed Roe, it was a five to four decision. And all five justices who voted to protect abortion rights have been appointed by Republican presidents. Justice Blackmun by President Nixon, Justice Stevens by President Ford, Justice O'Connor and Kennedy by President Reagan, Justice Souter by first President Bush. Justice Alito writing for the court said that Roe was quote, egregiously wrong and quote, exceedingly poorly reasoned. He said a right should be protected in the constitution only if it's in the text or part of the original meaning or a long unbroken tradition. It is rare in all of American history that the Supreme Court has taken a right away from people. And that's exactly what the Supreme Court did, putting many people's lives in jeopardy, putting many people's health in jeopardy and making abortion what's gonna be the dominant issue in our political and legal process for years to come. Let me talk about a second area where the Supreme Court dramatically changed the law last term, and that's with regard to religion. And there were two cases about religion. One was Carson versus Macon, came down on Tuesday, June 21st. There are parts of the state of Maine that are too rural to support public school systems. In those areas, school administrative units give money to parents to send their children to private school. Maine law says that the money has to be used at a secular private school. It can't be used at a religious private school. Two families brought a challenge to this. Altogether, it affects about 5,000 children a year in Maine. The lower courts ruled in favor of Maine. They said that Maine has an important interest in providing a free secular education to all students. They said Maine has an important interest in not taxing some people to support the religion of others. The Supreme Court six to three reversed and ruled in favor of the parents. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion for the court and said, whenever the government gives money for private secular education, the constitution requires that it give money to religious education. Otherwise the government violates free exercise of religion. Justice Breyer and Justice Sotomayor wrote dissents joined by Justice Kagan. Justice Breyer and Sotomayor both said, what about the establishment clause of the First Amendment that's always been thought is embodying the words of Thomas Jefferson? There should be a wall that separates church and state. This is a decision that's also gonna have dramatic effects. Think about how here in California, there are charter schools. These are schools paid for by the government but privately run. California law says they must be secular. I don't think that's constitutional anymore. Where there are many government programs that have always gone for secular activities, but the government now wants to subsidize religion. These two seem constitutionally suspect in light of the court's decision. To explain how dramatic this is, for decades the issue was, when may the government give aid to religious schools without that being an impermissible establishment of religion? Now it's when must the government give aid to religious schools or it violates free exercise of religion? There's another case about religion. There's Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. It involved a high school football coach in Bremerton, in Washington State. He made it a practice after football games of going onto the 50 yard line and kneeling and praying. He said he was a devout Christian and this was required. Sometimes students from his team would join him, sometimes students from the other team. A parent complained. The parent said, My son's a football player. He and our family are atheists. My son feels he won't get as much playing time unless he also participates in the prayer. The school told the football coach, stop what you're doing. The football coach briefly complied. And then he began the practice of going on the field after games and delivering a Christian inspirational message that he described as a prayer. And he's often joined by players of one or both teams, sometimes even fans in the stands. The school suspended him and placed him on administrative leave. He sued and said that this violated 
his free exercise of religion rights, and his free speech rights. The lower courts ruled against him and said that for 60 years, the Supreme Court had held that prayer in public schools, even voluntary prayer violates the Establishment Clause. The United States Supreme Court in a six to three decision ruled in favor of the football coach. Justice Gorsuch wrote the opinion for the court. Justice Sotomayor wrote the dissent. The court said it does violate free exercise and free speech rights to keep him from being able to pray. The court overruled the decision that since 1971 had been followed to determine when the government violates the Establishment Clause. Again, Justice Sotomayor said, what about the Establishment Clause? Since the early 1960s, the court in every instance said that prayer in public schools is unconstitutional. She said, this really opens the door to teachers being able to pray. At the very least, if they're in the classroom before school, recess, when kids have their heads down on the desk, lunch after school, if a teacher wants to pray and students want to join, that's the teacher's right. Again, for decades, the issue was how and when government prayer in schools violates the Establishment Clause. Now it's how teachers have a First Amendment right to engage in prayer, and otherwise it violates the free exercise of religion and the freedom of speech. One more area from last term that I would talk about, and that concerns the Second Amendment. From 1791, when the Second Amendment was ratified, until June 2008, not once did the Supreme Court find any federal, state, or local law to violate the Second Amendment. In the handful of cases about the Second Amendment, the Supreme Court always said, it means what it says. It's about a right to have guns for purpose of militia service. In June 2008, in District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court said that the Second Amendment protects a right to have guns in the home for the sake of security. The court struck down a 32-year-old DC ordinance that prohibited private ownership and possession of handguns. Now, 14 years later, in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, the Supreme Court said, the Second Amendment protects a right to have guns outside the home and a right to have concealed weapons. It involved a New York law adopted in 1907 that said in order to have a weapon in public, concealed weapon in particular, a person needed a permit. And to get a permit, the individual would need to show cause for having a concealed weapon. And the court said cause required showing a safety need for a concealed weapon. California law was almost identical to this. Challenge was brought. The lower federal courts upheld the law. The Supreme Court 6-3 to three declared it unconstitutional. Justice Thomas wrote for the court. As I said, he explained that the right, Second Amendment right to bear arms includes the right to have guns in public and right to conceal weapons. He then went even further. And he said the only gun regulations that should be allowed are those that were historically permitted. And historically means in 1791 or maybe 1868 when the Second Amendment was ratified. Let me read you his exact language. He said, only if a firearm regulation is consistent with the nation's historical tradition, may a court conclude that individual's conduct falls outside the Second Amendment's command. He said, the Second Amendment is the very product of interest balancing by the people. And it surely elevates, above all other interests, the right of law-abiding citizens to use arms for self-defense. Never has the Supreme Court said that the First Amendment elevates freedom of speech above all interests. Never has the court said that the 14th Amendment elevates the protection against race discrimination above all other interests. This provides gun rights more protection than any others in the Constitution. Well, let me just say a word about this term of the court and then a word about the long-term future. This term again, the Supreme Court has cases that are likely to dramatically change the law and push it much further to the right. On October 31st, a week from Monday, the Supreme Court's gonna hear two cases, Students for Fair Admission versus University of North Carolina and Students for Admission versus Harvard College about whether or not college universities continue to engage in affirmative action, where they continue to use race as one factor in admission decisions to benefit minorities. I don't think anyone, liberal or conservative, has much doubt as to what the Supreme Court's going to do, how it's gonna overrule 44 years of precedent and eliminate affirmative action, and what a devastating effect that's gonna have on diversity in higher education.
the Supreme Court has a case before it, 303 Creative versus Alenis, about whether or not a web designer can refuse to design websites for same-sex weddings. The court's gonna decide whether that person's freedom of speech and implicitly free exercise of religion gives the right to violate anti-discrimination laws and to discriminate against gays and lesbians. And in Moore versus Harper, the Supreme Court's gonna decide whether state courts can enforce state constitutions to protect voting rights. And if the court says they can't and disempower states, the implications are just enormous for our democratic process. Well, I said I wanted to conclude by looking at the long-term for the Supreme Court. If you look at the age of the justices, Clarence Thomas is the oldest at 74, Samuel Alito is 72, John Roberts is 67, and the three Trump appointees Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett are all in their 50s. I've long thought that the best predictor of a long lifespan is being confirmed for a seat on the Supreme Court. <laughs> Justice John Paul Stevens didn't retire until he was 90. Justice Ginsburg passed away while still on the bench at age 87. So it's easy to imagine five or six of these justices being together for another decade or two. Our country is more politically polarized than it's been at any time since Reconstruction. What will it mean to have a court that's come down so solidly on one side of that political divide and so far to the right with regard to the political divide? The Supreme Court now has the lowest approval ratings it's ever had in American history. According to Marquette University poll in, in July, it had a 38% approval and a 61% disapproval. What will that mean for the court? What will it mean for our society to have a court that's so lost its legitimacy? Uh, I'm going to uh, apologize to begin um, by saying that I'm, I'm going to um, zip through these uh, slides <laughs> uh, like the native New Yorker I am with uh, uh, fast uh, so I could try to wrap this up before uh, my time is over. Uh, if you want a copy of the slides, uh, there's my, my email address there. You can find me on the Berkeley uh, website. Uh, just send me an email and I'm happy to send you uh, a copy of the slides. Okay, um, so uh, the two cases I'm going to talk about, um, and before I talk about any of the details, uh, I'll just introduce them uh, and get to them later in uh, the talk, uh, is uh, McGirt v. Oklahoma, which was a 2020 case that um, uh, has been, uh, uh, the majority opinion, five to four opinion, was written by uh, Neil Gorsuch, who, uh, a Republican appointee um, to the court, who um, is very well respected in Indian country and is, and is has long before he was appointed was seen as a friend of tribal sovereignty. Um, and uh, what, what this decision did was to um, <clears throat> basically declare that um, uh, most of Eastern Oklahoma was still uh, uh, what's technically called in federal Indian law, Indian country. Uh, and that the reservations that had been established there in the uh, 19th century uh, were still um, a legal Indian territory in which uh, tribal governments have very expansive rights of self-government. And the state of Oklahoma has very limited rights of intrusion into that. Um, and uh, the other case uh, that um, I'll talk about a little bit uh, is um, a Castro uh, Huerta v. Oklahoma uh, that was handed down, uh, I think it was this past June, um, that um, uh, uh, it doesn't seem problematic on the surface. Uh, what the case uh, declared, what the decision declared was that uh, the state of Oklahoma has concurrent criminal jurisdiction with the federal government over um, any non-Indian who uh, uh, commits a crime against an Indian person. And uh, we'll get to why that um, is perceived in Indian country as a great loss uh, for tribal sovereignty. So, uh, for, okay, so the first thing I get to talk about my own research really briefly. Um, uh, so uh, you heard in the introduction, um, almost all of my work is, uh, is on uh, this little place. Oh, I guess I can't, I can't use the cursor. Uh, this, this, this little place right here, uh, Rosebud Reservation. I am from New York, but I spent all my, my adult time uh, uh, working on the history, political history of Rosebud Reservation, um, and it's uh, it's one of the the major uh, Sioux or Great Sioux Nation reservations um, in South Dakota, 
uh, home of the Oglala, uh, excuse me, the, the, the uh, Rosebud Sioux or Sichangu Lakota. Uh, the reservation is interesting because it's, um, uh, it's characterized by something called checkerboarding, uh, which in uh, Indian country means that uh, the land is actually uh, checkerboarded with um, uh, plots of land that are owned either by individual Indian people or by the tribal government. Um, and those pieces of land are held in trust for the tribe or for the individual uh, by uh, the Secretary of the Interior. And uh, there's no question that tribal law applies in those places uh, on that trust land. Uh, but the, so uh, the, the trust land is, all, is the, the, the pinkish colored, <laughs> the pinkish colored, the yellow colored, and um, is there another, anyway, pinkish and yellow. And then uh, these light colored places, almost white, um, uh, that's uh, land that's, uh, most of that is owned by non-Indian people, mo mostly by white people. And um, it's not, um, um, uh, it's not under tr uh, the tr a trust protection. And um, many um, of the tribe's laws, um, particularly, um, well, we'll get to this in a second. The, the tribes have a great deal of difficulty applying um, under the existing um, uh, rules as laid down by the federal courts to, they have a great deal of difficulty applying either criminal or civil law on these non-Indian areas and on non-Indians, even within the reservation. Um, so just to get a concrete picture of what it looks like, there's the tribal court, humble though it may be, it, it uh, it, um, it, it does uh, uh, have both criminal and civil cases, and it does have a Supreme Court, and it's a court of record. Um, and uh, this is um, the tribal government uh, being sworn in. Um, and uh, this, I, th I don't think it's a, it's a current picture. I think this may have been 2012. Um, uh, so if you look at the population on the reservation, it's um, uh, the majority of it, 88.7% is American Indian. Uh, most of these people who are uh, listed as two or more races in, in, sorry, in the U.S. Census are probably also uh, American Indians. Uh, the next largest group is um, white people, 710. Um, so uh, about 10% um, about of the population is non-Indian. And uh, most of those people are adamantly opposed to the tribe having any kind of jurisdiction, certainly not criminal jurisdiction over them. Uh, but even um, civil, civil or regulatory jurisdiction. Um, so for example, there's a, um, well, the tribe does have a law and order code. Um, they, uh, uh, this, the uh, Native American Rights Fund um, uh, nonprofit organization in um, uh, Boulder, Colorado um, uh, assisted the tribe in establishing its uh, part of its its law and order code. And then the tribe has also uh, hired outside uh, legal firms to help them uh, with, with uh, different titles within their code. But uh, so they, they have a, a code that looks a lot like a state code. Um, and you can see here's a list of the crimes and for, e for each of the crimes, um, the, um, um, <clears throat> uh, the uh, criminal penalties are, are laid out in the code. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, um, the tribe can't, um, because of the Supreme Court, an old decision going back to 1978, um, which held that Indian tribes um, cannot exercise criminal jurisdiction over non-Indian people, which in almost all cases means white people. Um, and uh, the reason for that is because um, when the tribes were incorporated into the United States, operative word incorporated, it's not the way tribes see it. Uh, they, uh, they've lost their status as um, sovereign nations that have the right to full territorial jurisdiction over their territory. So uh, this, uh, this threw down the gauntlet as far as the tribes were concerned. This was a, this is a very serious um, uh, intrusion into tribal sovereignty, which the tribes have been trying um, since 1978 to get Congress to correct. Uh, and after a long struggle uh, in back in 2013, um, when the Violence Against Women Act was renewed by Congress, um, they were able to get the tribes uh, through their lobbyists were able to get inserted uh, 
into the legislation a provision that awarded criminal jurisdiction to tribal governments over uh, non-Indians who, um, uh, the way that the tri uh, Rosebud Sioux tribe has it in its criminal code, sorry, um, the Rosebud, uh, the Rosebud Sioux Tribes um, criminal jurisdiction shall extend to non-Indians who are uh, by federal law are subject to the tribe, that's by the, the uh, Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act, are subject to the tribe's special jurisdiction, it's called special jurisdiction, who commit violent crimes, specifically domestic violence and dating violence against American Indian Indians within the tribe's jurisdiction. So that was that was definitely, I, I don't want to say it was a Band-Aid, um, you know, it'd probably be better to say that it's a patch, but from tribal governments, um, the point of view of tribal governments all over the country, there's still this um, glaring gap in law enforcement in which they're not able to um, arrest, uh, well, the simple, the simple matter is that they're not even allowed to give non-Indian people a, um, a, a traffic ticket. And, um, uh, they also have a land, the tribe in its um, uh, law and order code has a, a land use code um, that um, uh, basically uh, is, is about zoning. Uh, they also have an environmental protection uh, code. Again, both of these are, um, uh, they look very much like what states would have in um, the land use laws codified in state law and environmental laws. Um, but the tribe cannot, um, I should say the tribe is afraid to enforce these laws on non-Indian people living on deeded land within the reservation. And uh, mostly because the um, civil jurisdiction that Indian tribes, the right that Indian tribes have to exercise civil or regulatory jurisdiction over non-Indians is a gray area. Uh, and the reason for that um, is uh, there's been a lot of litigation, but the, the, the initial um, uh, the pushing back against tribal um, civil jurisdiction over non-Indian people was a 1981 case in which the Supreme Court except, uh, uh, said that ex except for special circumstances, um, tribes really have no business um, uh, trying to regulate um, through its civil law. Um, uh, the activities of non-Indian people who haven't um, uh, uh, entered into some kind of consensual relationship with the tribe, such as by getting married to a tribal member in tribal court, um, or unless the, the non-Indians are doing something that threatens um, the, uh, the well-being and integrity of the tribe or its people, right? So there's been a lot of litigation uh, over the years about um, what the exceptions to this limit on tribal um, uh, civil jurisdiction over non-Indians, uh, but it remains a gray area to the extent that tribes are hesitant to um, enforce it because they're afraid that non-Indians will go to court, which means federal court, and that it would quickly go to the Supreme Court and that they would quickly lose. Uh, so there's, um, they won't enforce this against the tribes. Okay. I'm going to skip that. Okay, so Oklahoma v. Um, McGirt. I'm actually going to go back to my earlier slide. Um, the um, um, it recognized um, the boundaries of the um, uh, Muscogee uh, Creek Reservation, um, which actually in includes uh, about half of the city of Tulsa, which which is interesting. What that means is that uh, within the Muscogee Creek um, uh, Reservation, most of you folks are probably aware that um, the so-called five civilized tribes, Cherokee Creek, Chickasaw uh, uh, Creek are actually called Mus Muscogee. Um, Chickasaw, Seminole, and Choctaw were removed from east of the um, uh, Mississippi in uh, after the 1830s, beginning in the 1830s and lasting actually into the um, 1850s. Uh, they were removed to um, Indian country, what's now Oklahoma. And at the time that they um, were, um, uh, or just prior to being removed, they signed treaties with the US government that where the US government pri uh, promised that if, when, as they gave up their lands in the East, they would have uh, lands of equal value um, uh, ex uh, set up and uh, made uh, for their exclusive use and for their permanent occupation, the word permanent occupation, permanent home, 
uh, was actually in the treaty language. And um, uh, this is a, a map of um, the Creek Reservation. Again, it's the Muscogee Nation, um, but uh, often called Creek Reservation. Um, that um, uh, this is from 1902, that um, the reservation uh, was um, divided up into what, are, what were called allotments um, of 160 acres, or sometimes a, a different figure depending on the quality of the land. And, each of these um, tracts of land was given to an individual um, uh, with fee title. Uh, um, uh, so it, it wasn't trust land, uh, but it was uh, protected from alienation uh, for the first few years because it was concerned that uh, native people um, might, um, uh, might lose their land. Um, and indeed, um, once the restrictions were removed um, in the early 20th century, so, um, the McGurr case um, that was uh, uh, the majority opinion was um, written by Neil Gorsuch, held that the 1833 uh, uh, treaty with them, or it cited the 1850, uh, uh, 1833 treaty with the Muscogee, um, <clears throat> uh, in which they, um, they were awarded, if that's the right word, um, because it was compensation for lands that they had previously had in the East. Um, uh, fixed borders of lands as a permanent home to the whole Creek Nation of Indians, so long as they shall exist as a nation. And uh, to make a long story short, um, what uh, Gorsuch wrote in the majority opinion is that a treaty is a treaty is a treaty. And as the Constitution um, is it, well known to anybody who's uh, a practitioner of federal Indian law and also well known to tribal governments in the United States, Treaties are the supreme law of the land. They're as binding on the US government as are the Constitution says they're as binding on the US government as is the Constitution itself. Um, so um, what this did was to take um, this large area in um, can actually, uh, because the implications were not just for the, the Muscogee Nation, but also for the Chick Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Cherokee. These were all reservations um, uh, and Seminole. These were all reservations that had been um, assumed to have been um, uh, disestablished simply by the native individuals who owned those allotments, selling those allotments or losing them through um, uh, uh, defaulted mortgages or um, through sales to non-Indians uh, under pressure. Um, uh, more, the assumption was on the part of Oklahoma that uh, that meant that the reservations disappeared piece by piece as the, um, uh, as the lands were alienated from Indian people and that they no longer existed. So the, um, the McGirt decision um, has been called by one Indian law professor from Arizona State, um, uh, uh, the Indian law bombshell because what it did was really to change the jurisdictional um, uh, map, literally, of Oklahoma. So um, uh, tribal governments have uh, jurisdiction over um, uh, native people um, throughout these reservations, right? And, and more importantly, the state of Oklahoma does not have criminal jurisdiction and usually no civil jurisdiction over Indian people in this wide swath of the state of um, Oklahoma, including, you know, keep in the back of your mind, the, the southern half of the city of Tulsa. So the cops in Tulsa can't give a, a state a ticket for running a red light uh, to an American Indian um, in that part of Tulsa. Uh, so this is recognized by Indian people all over the country as a stunning, um, if not the most stunning um, decision by the Supreme Court uh, supporting tribal sovereignty. Uh, it was quickly um, uh, compensated, or not compensated, it was, it was quick, quick, quickly counterbalanced uh, by the decision um, that uh, uh, the majority opinion was written by um, Justice Kavanaugh, I, I, I think it was this past June, um, uh, Castro v. Huerta, uh, that um, held that um, uh, the state actually does have jurisdiction, of course, the state has jurisdiction over non-Indian people uh, who, on the reservation. Um, that's, it does, it's not, of course, from the point of view of tribes, but it's, of course, from the point of view of the Supreme Court. 
Uh, but in addition to that, um, the um, uh, state courts have um, criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians who harm an Indian victim. Uh, and th the case involved uh, child neglect. And uh, so you might think, well, isn't it good for the tribal community um, to have uh, the, 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 the federal government does um, through its trust responsibility and, th and, and through statute law, uh, exercise criminal jurisdiction over non-Indian people who harm Indian victims, isn't it only more in the interests of Indian people to also have the state uh, be recognized as it was in this case as having concurrent jurisdiction with the federal government? And I'm sure that that's why the state fought it because they knew that it, it would look like the tribes were mean-spirited uh, if they fought it. Um, uh, but it, um, it's, it, it's perceived, widely perceived as a fundamental um, incursion into tribal sovereignty um, because of the, the, um, the principle of the thing, right? The principle uh, from the tribe's point of view should be a government to government relationship in which the state does not try to enter the territory of the tribe, even if it's the state's jurisdiction over non-Indians. And uh, this case, although it seems like it's protecting Indian people by um, uh, uh, allowing the state to exercise criminal jurisdiction along with the federal government over people who hurt Indian people. Um, in fact, it's a, a form of, a, this is the way it's seen by tri uh, uh, advocates for tribal sovereignty as an incursion into tribal sovereignty because what it does is to undermine the um, idea that tribal governments should have uh, um, uh, territorial jurisdiction over all persons uh, within their territory. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we leave that. Okay. Uh, thank you okay. so much. There's just so much to talk about. Um, and I want to make sure there's um, time right. for everyone well, yeah. time for questions. Yeah. So thank, thank you for. To, um, well, it's imperative for me to ensure that my lipstick was not smudged. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. Um, let's start at the beginning. In 1973, the Supreme Court decided Roe versus Wade, and the court held that the due process clause of the Constitution was properly interpreted to protect a person's right to terminate a pregnancy before fetal viability. And it is likely true that one of the most famous aspects of Roe versus Wade is the trimester framework that it established. Um, and that framework provided that during the first trimester, the state was prohibited from regulating abortion any differently than it regulated other medical procedures. During the second trimester, the state could regulate abortion in order to protect the pregnant person's health. And the logic here was that abortion during the second trimester posed greater medical risks than childbirth. And so the state had an interest in making sure that the abortion procedure posed as few risks as possible. And finally, during the third trimester, the state could prohibit abortion altogether, as long as it made exceptions for abortions that were needed when continuing the pregnancy threatened the life or the health of the pregnant person. And the logic here was that the fetus reached viability during the third trimester. And the court reasoned that at the point of fetal viability, the state's interest in protecting fetal life could trump the pregnant person's interest in terminating an unwanted pregnancy. And so as my very wonderful Dean has already said, this opinion was seven two, meaning that only two justices dissented, which is really quite remarkable. Um, also remarkable that many of the, or several of the justices in the majority were appointed by Republican presidents. A justice in the dissent was appointed by a Democratic president, which is all to say um, that the issue of abortion was much less partisan um, in 1973. Um, still, Roe versus Wade was derided and criticized from the moment that it was handed down. And anti-abortion activists and advocates immediately began brainstorming ways to limit Roe. And the end goal, of course, was to overturn it. Um, so by 1992, the composition of the Supreme Court had changed enough that anti-abortion activists believed that there was a majority of justices on the court who were willing to overturn Roe versus Wade outright. 
And in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the court was asked to do just that. Um, and it's kind of important to set Planned Parenthood versus Casey in historical context. And so Planned Parenthood versus Casey was handed down at a time that was similar to 2022, in which there had all, there been a lot of movement against Roe versus Wade, a lot of um, anti-abortion activists, you know, just trying their hardest to overturn um, that decision. And so again, it seemed like the Supreme Court, the composition of the thing had shifted enough that there were enough justices on the Supreme Court who were willing to overturn Roe versus Wade. And so they asked the court to do just that. And in 1992, the court declined. But then again, in 2022, um, the court um, um, accepted that invitation. So Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992 was a surprise. So we were, you know, we were expecting um, a different decision. Um, so instead of overturning Roe versus Wade, um, the court said that a woman's right to terminate her pregnancy before viability is the most central principle of Roe. It is a rule of law and a component of liberty we cannot renounce. And while the court did uphold what it called the central principle of Roe um, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, it did get rid of the trimester framework. Um, and the court replaced the trimester framework with the undue burden standard. Um, the undue burden standard, um, unlike under the trimester framework where the court, where states were prohibited from regulating abortion at, um, at, in any way during the first trimester and could regulate abortion um, in the interest of protecting health during the second trimester, the undue burden standard permitted abortion regulations throughout the entirety of pregnancy. Um, and the idea here was that the court in Roe had underestimated the state's interest in the protection of fetal life. And so the states were permitted under the undue burden standard to promote uh, fetal life throughout pregnancy. And states could do that through the informed consent process by telling pregnant folks that their abortion will kill the life of a separate, unique living human being, which is what North Dakota and South Dakota um, required uh, physicians to tell pregnant folks before terminating a pregnancy. Um, states could promote fetal life um, through various uh, requiring pregnant folks to look at waiting um, at uh, ultrasound images through waiting periods requiring 72 hours to pass between the giving of information and the performance of the abortion procedure. Um, essentially, the undue burden standard allowed states to erect obstacles in front of um, abortion care. And many of those obstacles would be surmountable by people with privilege, class privilege, to privilege of living in cities, for example. But those obstacles were insurmountable by folks without privilege, people who were poor, people who lived in rural areas, people who had disabilities, people who were young people who were undocumented. Um, so abortion rights supporters uh, were very critical of Casey. Um, the undue burden standard was a very weak protector of abortion rights, but it did something, right? It did protect states from banning abortion outright. Um, until in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, um, the court upheld Mississippi's ban on abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy and in the process overturned Roe versus Wade as well as Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Um, Justice Alito, writing for a five-person majority, argued that Roe was egregiously wrong and as such the court was not bound by stare decisis to respect it as precedent. Dobbs declared that Roe erred when it interpreted the 14th Amendment due process clause to protect a right to terminate a pre-viability pregnancy and so far, according to the majority, because the clause only protects the rights that are, quote, deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. And for the Dobbs majority, the country's laws in 1868 the year that the 14th Amendment was ratified determine whether abortion rights can be characterized as, quote, deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. And so Alito canvasses abortion regulations um, in and around 1868 and concludes that abortion rights are not part of the great nation's history and tradition because until the latter part of the 20th century, such a right was entirely unknown in American law. Indeed, when the 14th Amendment was adopted, three quarters of the states made abortion a crime at all stages of pregnancy. Several things to mention on this. Um, the painfully obvious point is that folks capable of pregnancy were not part of the body politic 
during the period of the nation's history that the majority believes um, is decisive of the constitutional inquiry. Women could not vote in the country for another half a century after 1868. As Justice Breyer explains in his dissent, people did not ratify the 14th Amendment, men did. <laughs> So it is perhaps not so surprising that the ratifiers were not perfectly attuned to the importance of reproductive rights for women's liberty or for their capacity to participate as equal members of our nation. Indeed, the ratifiers, both in 1868 and when the original constitution was approved in 1788, did not understand women as full members of the community embraced by the phrase, we the people. Because women could not participate in the democratic process, we can reasonably assume that their interests were not reflected in any of the nation's laws, including the criminal laws that the Dobbs majority reads as foreclosing a constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy. And so the majority's choice to privilege the year 1868 and to attempt to divine the meaning of the constitution by looking at the nation's practices during that time is a choice to privilege an era characterized by the formal exclusion of women and people capable of pregnancy. I wanna to mention two other things. <laughs> the first thing I wanna mention is his, uh, Alito conducts this sort of historical inquiry into you know, whether abortion was protected in 1868. And he's not lying that there were a slew of criminal abortion laws um, on the books in 1868. What is interesting is that this is a selective history because had you looked prior to um, the mid 19th century, uh, Alito would have observed and been forced to admit that abortion was permitted in this country up until quickening. And from the time of the founding of the nation until about the mid 19th century, again, abortion was legal in states up until quickening. It wasn't until the mid 19th century that there was a social movement <laughs> to criminalize abortion. And this uh, social movement were, were led by obstetrician gynecologists, um, to be precise, white obstetrician male gynecologists who are interested in taking the field of obstetrics and gynecology away from those who had been deemed experts in that field before midwives, right? Women who were who would provide gynecological and obstetric care um, to other folks. And so this movement to professionalize the field of obstetrics and gynecology um, led to the passage of these criminal abortion laws, the laws that Alito cites as decisive of the constitutional inquiry as determining that abortion rights um, are not protected in the constitution today. So again, this is a selective history that um, Alito chooses to privilege in the Dobbs majority opinion. The second thing I want to mention about Alito's choice to engage in this historical inquiry is because Alito chooses to, to engage in a historical inquiry. I keep saying chooses because he could have chosen not to engage in a historical inquiry at all. Um, he's done it before. Um, I invite you guys to take a look at a decision in 2016 called Fisher versus Texas. Um, in this case, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the University of Texas's race-based affirmative action program. Um, Justice Alito dissented from the majority's upholding um, of this race-based affirmative action program. He would have struck it down as inconsistent um, with the Equal Protection Clause and its demands. In Justice Alito's dissent in Fisher versus Texas, there is no historical inquiry whatsoever. He doesn't attempt to determine what is permitted by the Equal Protection Clause by looking into the original public meaning of the Equal Protection Clause in 1868. He doesn't try to divine the intent of the framers of the Equal Protection Clause um, in 1868. He doesn't do this because it will lead to results that he doesn't like. I might remind you that the 14th Amendment Clause um, was passed um, at the end of the Civil War. It was designed to bring Black people into the body politic. It was designed to give a formal citizenship to formerly enslaved Black people. And so it seems clear that uh, the intent of the, of the 14th Amendment, um, of the Equal Protection Clause's uh, framers, the original public meaning behind the Equal Protection Clause, um, it would seem like race conscious efforts to make formerly enslaved Black people members of the body politic would be permissible. And so that explains why Justice Alito doesn't look to the original public meaning of the Equal Protection Clause when he's thinking about race-based affirmative action, because again, it doesn't lead to the results that he 
likes. Um, Alito's not the only um, offender on this. Uh, Justice Thomas, um, take a look at his dissent in Grutter versus Bollinger in 2003. Um, that's the case that the Supreme Court will overturn <laughs> when it decides uh, the uh, race-based affirmative action um, case um, this uh, coming term. Um, in that dissent, again, Justice Thomas wants to uh, strike down University of Michigan's race-based affirmative um, action program as inconsistent with uh, the Equal Protection Clause. No historical inquiry whatsoever. Essentially, Thomas just makes policy arguments about the impropriety of, of, um, of race-based affirmative action. Um, this is the same person who, as my wonderful dean has already explained, wrote the majority opinion in Bruin, um, the gun rights case this past term, in which in order to define the meets and bounds of the Second Amendment, he looks at what they were doing um, in the past um, when the Second Amendment was ratified and when the 14th Amendment was ratified. So again, originalism um, is, a, is a, not an inexorable, inexorable command <laughs> um, that originalists feel compelled to follow. Instead, it appears to be a tool that they pull out from their toolboxes um, in order to get the results that they like. And it's kind of, I don't like to make predictions about the court, but I feel pretty confident <laughs> about this prediction I'm about to tell you today, right now. Um, in the Harvard affirmative action case and students for fair admissions versus Harvard, students for fair admissions versus UNC, which the court will decide this term, I predict that originalism will not make an opinion um, in the majority opinion, um, overturning Grutter versus Bollinger and striking down race-based affirmative action programs as impermissible under the Equal Protection Clause. Um, a couple other things I wanna mention, not too much more. Um, it's important to understand that the method of constitutional interpretation that the Dobbs majority chooses to employ interpreting the constitution to protect only those behaviors and practices that were protected in 1868, it doesn't bode well for the persistence of other fundamental rights that earlier iterations of the court have found in the due process clause. Um, as the dissent in Dobbs puts it, the majority could write just as long in an opinion showing, for example, that until the mid 20th century, there was no support in American law for a constitutional right to obtain contraception. Likewise, in 1868, there was no support in American law for a constitutional right to consensual sex with an adult of the same sex, nor was there support in American law for a constitutional right to marry someone of the same sex. And so Dobbs majority protests, that opinion protests, that it said that the, the decision says nothing about the propriety of Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell, but those protestations ring a bit hollow. <laughs> the methodology of constitutional interpretation that the majority deploys to return the question of abortion's legality to the states could be just as easily um, be deployed to do the same with regard to the legality of contraception, the legality of same-sex sex, and the legality of same-sex marriage. And as a reproductive justice scholar, I want to point out that I can make the same point about the right to be free from coerced sterilization. Um, when the court was asked the question in 1927 in a case called Buck versus Bell, the court held that the constitution did not protect a right to be free from coerced sterilization. States could uh, sterilize without the consent um, those individuals that the state did not believe ought to reproduce. Um, and so um, if the court didn't believe in 1927 uh, that the constitution protected the right to be free from coerced sterilization, um, it is likely true that states weren't protecting the right to be free from coerced sterilization in 1868. And so the method of constitutional interpretation that the court uses in Dobbs um, would lead us to conclude that we can be sterilized without our consent. Um, and the constitution says nothing about it. Um, I wanna stop there because I do wanna leave time for Q and A. Um, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us today, both in person and online. I will be um, moderating questions, moving between questions um, from people in the room and from folks online. So if you are online, please use the chat box to uh, input your questions. And if you're in person, please raise your hands and we'll get started. I had a question about, oh, can you use the microphone? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, I had a question about, um, I guess, the upcoming court. Um, how much do you think they'll 
how much power do they think they'll give stare decisis um, with the cases they're um, hoping to bring up? Because Roe, they overturned two, which I don't think is aligned with stare decisis at all. But um, how can they throw that aside, knowing as it's been such um, a powerful doctrine for, the, for SCOTUS thus far? There's long articles in books written about precedent, and they all come to the same conclusion. Precedent should be followed, except when it should be overruled. <laughs> and of course, that has to be the answer, because almost everyone believes that precedent matters because it provides stability and predictability in the law. Just Clarence Thomas, one of the few people who says he believes precedent to be of no weight whatsoever. On the other hand, we all agree that there's times that precedent needs to be overruled. It was imperative that Brown versus Board of Education overrule mm. Plessy versus Ferguson. This is a court that doesn't give much weight to precedent, doesn't care, and precedent isn't going to stop what it wants to do. Isn't that just that in Dobbs, the court overrules Roe and Casey, or in Kennedy versus Bremerton schools, the court overrules Lemon versus Kurtzman? I could give you so many examples in the last few years where the court overruled longstanding precedent in a case called. Janus versus American Federation in 2018, the court overruled a 40 year old precedent, Abood versus Detroit Board of Education, in terms of the requirement that non union members pay the share of union dues that comports to collective activity, bargaining activity. A case that I argued in the Supreme Court and lost five to four, Franchise Tax Board versus Hyatt. The court overruled a 40 year old precedent, Nevada versus Hall, that said states could be sued in other states' courts. So when you get to this term of the court, the affirmative action cases, there are three prior decisions. Regents of University of California versus Baki, 1978, Grutter versus Bollinger, 2003, Fisher versus Texas Austin, 2016, all of which said that college universities can use race as one factor in many admissions decisions to enhance diversity and benefit minorities. I think the Supreme Court is going to overrule those decisions. So I don't think precedent matters. The only thing I'd qualify this with is I think if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016 rather than Donald Trump, and had she picked three justices, I think the liberal court would have considered overruling things like District Court versus Heller on the Second Amendment, Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. So I'm not sure that the conservatives pay less attention to precedent than liberals. They just want to overrule different ones. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I feel like Citizens United is the most important change in how our elections are financed and uh, the move from 1970 when there was like 50 lobbyists to like thousands of lobbyists. It's like there's a perception, a public perception, I think, that the American government is bought and sold. And uh, I don't know, is there any idea about how we're going to move past that? And, you know, because I don't think Congress is going to say, let's not have lobbyists, right? <laughs> um, I'll just, I'll just add um, to that, that I think that, you know, Citizens United cer certainly um, threatens our democratic processes. Um, I, I don't think um, it's, it might be a slight exaggeration. It's not a great exaggeration to say that, you know, elections are bought and sold and Citizens United um, uh, mm -hmm. permits that. Um, but I also think that um, probably the, one of the most devastating opinions that it's up there with Citizens United is Shelby County mm -hmm. versus Holder um, mm -hmm. in 2013, in which the court um, struck down the, the formula um, that uh, identified which jurisdictions, which states, um, had to get permission to change their voting laws um, from uh, either the attorney general or a three panel um, federal court. Um, and the idea behind, so essentially Shelby County versus Holder gutted um, that provision of the preclearance requirement, gutted that provision of the Voting Rights Act, which had done a great job of, of disallowing or preventing states 
from changing their voting laws in a way that was disenfranchising the voters that they didn't like. Um, and so the rash of voting restrictions that we see now, the you know voter roll purges and the voter ID requirements and the closure of polling places and the you know limitations on absentee voting and mail-in voting, all of that was was made, all of that is made possible by the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County versus Holder. Um, it green, that, that decision greenlit you know, the techniques that states are doing right now to disenfranchise voters. So um, I, often rem I often encourage my students to like, imagine a better country, <laughs> like what's gonna happen? Um, what do we need to do in order to produce a better country? And protecting our democratic institutions um, is part and parcel of that imagination. And so, um, that means overruling Citizens United, whether it's um, through, it's not going to happen, but you know, <laughs> it's just not, but a reversal in the Supreme Court or through a piece of federal legislation, um, or um, as well as uh, doing something, reinvigorating the Voting Rights Act of permitting um, the federal government to prevent states from disenfranchising vote. Otherwise, we only have a democracy in name alone. I uh, just wonder if there uh, is there any way that you can you guys can read any consistency into the lines of reasoning used by the courts in the in the past term. Um, so are we, are we can we see a discernible shift of pattern in, in terms of the reasoning that they used? Um, yeah, that's my question. I'll start by saying no. <laughs> no, no. I'll, I'll start by saying like the only thing that I can um, divine is a consistency in terms of decisions that align with the Republican Party's platform. Um, and this all this goes not just to the decisions that the court is making, but like the cases that it's deciding to hear, right? The court is controlling its own docket. Um, and so it is no coincidence that this term they heard abortion rights case, this term they heard a gun rights case, this term they heard a free exercise case, next term they're deciding to rule on affirmative action. The court is controlling, constructing its own docket and issuing decisions that essentially allow the, is either the Republican party or the conservative legal kind of, or, um, institution to construct the country in its image. Um, and again, I've tried, <laughs> I've, tri I've tried to, I think I spent much of my, the beginning of my career trying to, believing that the court or wanting to believe that the court was not a political body, um, but it's become, it's, they're making it really hard. They're making it really hard for me to believe that it's apolitical, um, and then to try to justify its decisions in any way other than this is what the Republican Party wants. I'm I've, like, no. I've never believed that. <laughs> I know. I I mean, I, I've, I've, I've never believed it. Mm -hmm. I've always believed that the decisions in the Supreme Court are a product of the ideologies of justice so that they're, when I had the chance to write the piece we were talking about, in 1989, I said, it's all about the values of the justices. It always has been. That's all there is. Um, and I mean, inevitably that's so because the constitution is written in broad language and the meaning that's given to it is reflection of those who are interpreting it. Constitutional rights aren't absolute. The government can interfere with even the most basic rights of it as a compelling interest. But what's a compelling interest? It's up to the justices who are there. Marbury versus Madison that created judicial review wouldn't have done so, but for John Marshall's ideology. The court from the 1890s to mid 1930s declared unconstitutional 200 federal, state, and local laws that protected workers and consumers because of the conservative ideology of the court. The only time there's been a liberal court in all of American history is the Warren Court. And it was really just the last seven years of the Warren Court from 1960 to 1959. But that's because of who was on the court. If Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, we wouldn't be talking about Dobbs or Bruin or affirmative action because the court wouldn't be reconsidering those cases. It's all about who's on the court. Um, I think that the court is very much embracing originalism, the view that the meaning of the constitution is determined when it's adopted 
I mentioned the Kennedy versus Bremerton school, the coach praying. Justice Gorsuch writing there and talking about how to determine what's an impermissible established religion wrote, the line that courts and governments must draw between the permissible and the impermissible has to accord with history and faithfully reflect the understanding of the founding fathers. Same thing in depth. Now, I agree very much with Chiara. I think the justices use originalism when it gets to the conservative results they want and ignore it when it doesn't, the affirmative action cases being illustration. Also, history is inherently inconclusive. And what justices can do is look through history to pick the examples they want and ignore the other. One judge said, it's like going to a cocktail party where you look for your friends. You look through the historical record, you look for what supports the conclusion you want to come to. And I just want to add to that. There's no way if you look at just to take the, um, the religion cases, taking like, that's not serious history. Not that any of this is done by the court is particularly serious history, but they're not even grappling with someone like, you know, they, they're sort of the reification of, of founders and originalism. And yet making decisions about funding um, religious schools ignores James Madison, who has a very clear text saying no funding should go to mm -hmm. religion, religious teachers. So, I mean, part of what's happening is, is there's a, there's a, a, a gesture to a, a method that doesn't even live up to what it claims to do. <laughs> I, 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 I want to add one thing and I'm going to, I'm going to do the make the unwise choice of not agreeing completely it's good. Um, it's good. It makes it more interesting. with Jane Chemerinsky. Um, but I do feel that in the past, judges and justices have felt constrained by their role. And they've felt constrained at least to offer reasons um, that um, could plausibly um, be held to not be political, right? Um, and so I offer two examples. One is, uh, one is in the past and one is to come. The first example just happens to be Chief Justice Roberts. <laughs> um, so it's a five justice majority in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, not a six justice majority because Chief Justice Roberts refused to join the majority opinion. Um, he would have upheld the Mississippi 15 week abortion ban, but he would not have overturned Roe versus Wade. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, Justice Chief Justice Roberts doesn't like abortion. There's no doubt in my mind um, that he believes that Roe versus Wade ought to be overturned, but he was not willing to sign on to a majority opinion, I feel because he felt constrained by his role. Um, I feel like um, as we move further into this uh, subsequent terms and this conservative supermajority, the judges will feel less constrained by their role um, and, and willing to make more, you know, obviously and unambiguously political decisions. And the second, um, second uh, example that I offer of perhaps the court <laughs> um, not being a political institution is in two, two come cases in which abortion bans and abortion regulations are challenged on First Amendment grounds. And so there are these, these arguments that are being made in state courts right now, they haven't yet appeared in federal courts, in which plaintiffs have argued that abortion bans prohibit them from practicing their religion. Um, they're mainly Jewish plaintiffs and Jewish plaintiffs have said, my religion demands that I not bring a, another life into this world when the birth of an additional baby will destabilize the family that I have and jeopardize the life and health of my existing children. And so you're compelling me to give birth violates my ability to practice my religion. This court, as my wonderful dean has already said, is very solicitous of, of, of uh, free exercise, very religious, solicitous of religious freedom. And I'm, 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 I'm chomping at the bit to see how they handle this question when the free exercise of religion might lead them to, to decide that abortion regulations cannot apply to a particular um, subset. So we'll see, right, we'll see. <laughs> I know we have um, one question here in the audience. I also want to get one um, from the folks online, which is, can we, the people, do anything? <laughs> and perhaps while you think about that, we can also ask another question, and then um, we'll have three minutes. To... <laughs> Mine was going to be similar to that one, but um, when when uh, Dobbs, the Dobbs decision was sort of leaked originally, sort of pre 
pre-released and um, we saw a certain amount of, let's say buyer's remorse from certain <laughs> senators, um, like Collins and Murkowski and others. And is there anything they can do? Mm-hmm. Which I guess goes with, is there anything we can do? Mm-hmm. What does the Senate have any real? Well, there's nothing that they can do. <laughs> there's nothing they can do. Um, um, but also they knew what they were doing, right? Like uh, nobody seriously believes that Kavanaugh um, and, and Coney Barrett, like, no, I mean, if they did, then we have bigger problems on our hands, right? Because um, we have very gullible people in the Senate. Um, so I, there's nothing the Senate can do, but there are like court reform um, things that are floating around. I hate to call it court packing um, because that is precisely what the Republicans have done <laughs> is to pack not just the court, but the federal judiciary um, at large, but court expansion, um, perhaps there are ways to regulate the court's docket. Um, so that they are not choosing the cases that they, you know, want to choose. I've seen sort of, um, sort of proposals around what can be done um, to limit some of the power of the court, but um, I, you know, I don't think it's likely that we'll see that. Not in, not in my lifetime. <laughs> I would answer the question that's put as this many to First, we have to remember elections really matter. The reason why we have this court is because of the 2016 presidential election. It's crucial who controls the Senate. If the Republicans take the Senate in November, then Biden would have no chance of getting a Supreme Court just confirmed. He's not going to get any federal court of appeals judges confirmed. So I think the first lesson of all this is the importance in terms of what people could do is getting involved in terms of elections in the committee. Second, with regard to abortion rights, it's really important to be involved in everything we can do to protect those rights. Um, it's now left to the states and it's gonna be left to state courts and it's gonna be left to state initiatives and be left to state legislatures. Um, there's been the occasional triumph like in Kansas, but there's also been terrible laws adapted in places like Oklahoma, Indiana, West Virginia, and we can give other states, but we're gonna to have to, when it comes to advancing rights, reproductive choice rights, other rights, fight it out in state courts, fight it out in state legislatures and the like. So I think that's important. And that really involves then also being involved in the organizations that work in this, working with groups like Planned Parenthood or the ACLU or the NAACP League Defense Fund, because we all can be much more powerful working with others and working through organizations. And third, I think we need to articulate a long-term progressive vision for the constitution. Republicans were very successful through the Federalist Society, through the way in which they developed their theories. I think progressives need to do the same. I'm skeptical that the court reforms are going to happen. Um, Congress could change the size of the Supreme Court, but we know the Republicans are going to filibuster that. Term limits would be a great idea. I think we'd take constitutional amendments. I think the court would declare unconstitutional anything they try to limit control over its docket. Maybe the court's legitimacy will fall so much that like in the 1930s, some of those things become much more plausible, but I don't think today they are. Any other final words? Well, with that optimistic <laughs> ending, I mean, <laughs> much if anyone say. has. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists and thank you all for joining us today, both in person and online. Um, as uh, although there is a, a fair amount of pessimism, there is also, of course, um, the action through voting and through state and local politics. So I suppose we can take that as uh, what we can do moving forward. States and local elections, advocacy organizations, and getting people to vote in general. And with that, I think we'll end for today. And thank you again to all of our panelists. Thank you.